Hello. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a huge privilege and an honor to speak here. Um, am I okay? No echo good? We good? We're, yeah, okay, that's progress. That's wonderful. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name's uh, Dr. David Zadl, and I'm considered one of the world's leading experts when it comes to how video games are changing society, and in particular, oh, how the way video games make money is changing society. So if you're anything like me, uh, when you started out playing video games, uh, they looked sort of a bit like this. Uh, this is Prince of Persia. This is actually the first game uh, that my father ever bought for me. It's a game of my childhood, and both myself and many of my friends had an enormously fun experience playing this wonderful platforming game. Um, and Prince of Persia was a popular game. It was also a very lucrative game. And the way it made money was through a very classic model of video game monetization, which is basically based around convincing as many people as possible to hand over as much money as possible uh, for one of these. So it's a model of selling video games where video games are sold as a product. But this is a problematic way of making money for the video games industry. Uh, and has been for years, and for years stakeholders from the video games industry have been trying to work out a different way to sell things than encouraging people to hand over money in return for box products, and it's because it's incredibly high risk. So imagine you're a video game studio, you're making a game, the whole time you're producing this game you are hemorrhaging money, you're maybe losing millions and millions of pounds producing, uh, developing it. Then you are producing that game. You're maybe literally generating boxes and putting the disc into the box and trying to ship it off, or, or cartridges maybe. Or you're creating an advertising campaign for a digital download. Again, you're losing money. And then finally, you've got a window where you're trying to sell your game. And you're trying to recoup all this money you've lost, all these millions of pounds, in a relatively narrow release window. This is a very similar model of monetization as, say, classic Hollywood studios, where you're trying to recoup all the losses you've made in the production of a big epic in a very narrow premiere window. And if there's one thing we know about classic Hollywood studios is that they often go bankrupt. It can take a single film to bankrupt a Hollywood studio. And that's what was happening in the games industry in the 90s and 2000s. You have one big flop and your whole studio went bust. So it's no surprise that people were looking for a way to make smooth the more reliable revenue. The primary way that they did this was by transitioning from using their games as products to using games as kind of semi-unregulated sales platforms. And if there's one thing to take away from this talk today, one change which has huge implications for financial harms, and particularly child financial harms, it's this, that many games aren't something you buy, they're now a sales platform. This, in the West at least, sort of kicked off in about 2006 with a, a game called Oblivion, which is uh, it's one of my all-time favorites. It's the predecessor to Skyrim, which was a hugely, hugely successful and popular game. It's a wonderful open world game. You could roam around, have a sword, hit people over the head, be a wizard, cast spells, ride around on a horse. And it was sold as a traditional box product, like, like most games were. You know, you'd spent 50 quid to get a copy of this. But what the makers of that game did, which was special and different, was they said, hold on. We know you spent 50 quid buying this game, but if you give us an additional two quid, you can have this lovely armor for your horse. And you can't find that armor for your horse anywhere in the game, and it looks extra special. And gamers were furious. They would stand for this. The idea that you've paid for a game, and now they're gonna sell you some additional content for a couple of quid, which should be in the game anyway. But they still bought it, and, <laughs> and, it, and it became an incredibly lucrative item. And before you knew it, the company was selling houses, items, extra weapons in the game. And this is the beginning of what we call microtransactions, and it's the beginning of games as sales platforms rather than products. So that's 2006. By 2018, you can conservatively estimate that the Candy Crush franchise is making more than a billion dollars annually just from the sale of these in-game goods and services and boosts. By the present day, it's very conservative to suggest that this market is worth 100 billion. It's probably worth several hundreds of billions. We don't have very hard data on the true extent of this. But this is, I mean, I guess that's higher than the, the product of some countries. This is enormous business. Um, and you can see why. It's great. So remember my previous slide where I had all these red bits where you're losing money as a company? Now you're not. You just develop your game once as a sales platform. 
And then your wheel of monetization never stops turning. You just bring things new, new things out to your platform. You just push more and more products onto the market. And you're continually making smooth and crucially predictable revenue over time, which keeps everyone, including your investors, very happy. Uh, but it's also kind of problematic. <laughs> because as you might anticipate, if you had sort of a bunch of tech bros with no real interest in responsible innovation, the ability to run their own tiny pocket universes with their own tiny pocket ecosystems, lots of problems happened. So we went, um, this is work led by my uh, wonderful collaborator, Yelena Petrovskaya. We, we asked gamers, we asked sort of uh, just over a thousand gamers, okay, can you tell us about a time that you've been coerced or you felt forced into making a purchase in a game? And they were happy to talk about it. There are dozens of strategies that players feel uncomfortable about, that players feel are predatory, that players feel are not in their best interests. And just to zoom in on one microcosm within this, you have this idea that sometimes the dynamics of a game are designed not to give players a good experience, but to force them to spend. So you have um, constructs like pay or grind, where you can either pay some money or you can spend hours and hours and hours of your life doing a repetitive, mind-numbing, unpleasant task. Or you have more extreme versions, pay or have some negative consequences. So maybe you have a really nice item in the game, which you're really enjoying using, and suddenly the game takes it away from you and says, that'll be two quid, <laughs> or you don't get that back. These are the strategies that players are reporting. And you may think, this is quite niche, uh, but it's not. We did a separate study where we estimated the prevalence of this on mobile. These are in 52% of top grossing mobile games. Uh, this is a really common way for games to make money. So what about the fringes? What's at the edge? Uh, we set up a machine learning algorithm to scan the Google Play Store to look for instances of extreme monetization. We basically had the algorithm scan reviews and see if people were talking about spending money. And then we looked at the proportion of reviews that were one star when they're talking about money. So these ones at the top, you've got 88% of reviews that talk about monetization being one star reviews. These are games where people have big problems. One thing you might notice is they're very available to children. Look at those Peggy age ratings. Do they look like they're doing their job? I would argue they're not really. Um, and also there seem to be specific players within the market who just push out products that are problematic and the platforms themselves don't appear to be taking sufficient notes of this. For instance, these games all have the shared issue that parents are reporting their children signing up to these games, getting a free trial, and then it immediately takes a credit card payment of like 75 or 100 quid with no recourse for repayment. But you wouldn't know that there were problems from the way the platform is promoting them. Look at those star ratings. That's up in four stars. As a parent, would you see anything there that convinces you that something problematic is going on for any of these games? They're generating hundreds of millions of installs. But when we're talking about problems, harm, financial harm in children, there's no topic that I think acts more as a lightning rod than loot boxes. Ooh. So loot boxes are items in games that may be bought with real world money, but which contain randomized contents whose value is uncertain at the point of purchase. So one way to think about this really easily is that these are just like the armor or the uh, weapons or the in-game items that I was talking about before. They're things that you're buying using the game as a sales platform. But the crucial difference here is that you don't know what you're getting. You spend three quid, you get a sealed box, you open it up, and it's only then you find out if it's something rubbish or if it's something you want. Um, in more tangible terms, this is what opening a loot box looks like. So this is Marvel Contest of Champions, popular children's game, fighting game, play with your favorite Marvel heroes. The way you get them is by buying these sealed crystals, which then spin around. Maybe it's someone rare. Oh no, it's just three-star Phoenix, which you already have. But by this point, you've already spent your cash. So loot boxes are incredibly common, it turns out. So this is all the research I present here is stuff we've done in the lab, by the way. Um, so if you go back 10 years to uh, 2010, they're in about 4% of play sessions on desktop or in PC games. By 2014, this has skyrocketed to more than half of play sessions taking place in a loot box game. And from then on, it kind of plateaus to about 70, 80% in the present day. So that's on desktop. What about on mobile? So on mobile, just over half of the top grossing games in 2019 contain loot boxes. 59% on iPhone, 58% on Android. So that's a couple of years ago. 
I'm going to be coming back to this towards the end, and you could guess whether you think this has got a uh, higher or lower, but it's, it's quite predictable which way, which way it's gone. Um, and the bad news is that uh, these are kind of hyper available to children as well. So of those like 58, 59% games, this is the proportion of those games deemed suitable for children age 12 or above. There's nothing here within the rating system, within the content descriptors, that are gating these off to children, or in any way saying that these might be something that you might not want children to access. Um, but there's lots of debate about the idea that you might not want children to access these, that they might lead to important financial effects for children. Um, more importantly, there are these kind of dual arguments that sort of say these look a lot like gambling, and therefore maybe they're causing either a gateway to gambling harm, or they're just so much like gambling that they kind of hurt people the same way that gambling hurts people. Uh, so you have these kind of like dual models, um, where under one thing you say, okay, loot boxes look a lot like a gambling product. When you're buying a loot box, you're staking some money on the chance outcome of some randomized process in the hope of getting something of greater value. That's a, that's a lot like gambling. So maybe it's so much like gambling that you're enjoying loot boxes, enjoying loot boxes, enjoying loot boxes, many of them styled similarly to, to gambling products. And then you go out into the outside world and you see something that looks a lot like a loot box, maybe a slot machine, and you're like, oh, maybe I'll have a go at this because I've been enjoying loot boxes so much. So a kind of rehearsal mechanism. And then there's this other proposed process where you say like, hold on a minute, these look a lot like gambling. Maybe people are getting financially involved in these in similar ways to gambling. Maybe similar behavioral biases are in play. Maybe people are similarly spending thousands of pounds. Maybe similar social and financial repercussions could occur in the game space. Uh, and when you talk to adolescents, so this is a, a piece of qualitative research we did where we said, okay, why, why are you buying all these? Um, when you talk to them, some of the motivations are like specific to games. So lots of adolescents will say, well, actually, I'm buying these because I want to be good at the game. Um, these loot boxes contain the items I need in order to progress or to be competitive. And lots of them will say, well, I want to hang out with my friends in this game, and I spend lots of time, and I want to look good, and I want to look a certain way. And you can only get the cosmetics, the things that make my character look a certain way, through the loot box. But others also say things that look astonishingly similar to, to what you might expect if you're talking about gambling rather than loot boxes. Um, this just feels good, man. Seeing other people opening hundreds, you get a few of that, feels good, keeps me going. It's addicting and thrilling, reaching into the unknown. These aren't the, mechani these aren't the words that you would typically associate with a non-gambling product. And indeed, there's an incredibly robust relationship in the literature between spending money on these things and engaging in gambling. The more money that people, including young people, uh, tend to spend on loot boxes, the more severe their gambling problems tend to be. You see this sort of dose-response relationship uh, wherever you go. And in fact, we've even started to see similar behavioral biases in play when people are opening loot boxes. So loss chasing is a crucial phenomenon in the development of disordered and problematic gambling. It's the idea of going back to win things that you've lost. Um, and it's widely acknowledged to be one of the most significant steps in developing disordered gambling. And many stakeholders started to say, like, oh, we kind of have been seeing children sort of doing something like that with loot boxes. And the Children's Commissioner came out and says, like, look, we believe there's this phenomenon where children are opening packs when they're losing. So you open a loot box, you get something rubbish, so you open another one, you get something rubbish, so you open another one, so you get something rubbish, and you carry on going until you get something that you like. Uh, but of course, uh, at this point, the games industry is still sort of insisting that loot boxes don't look like gambling, they sort of just look like a kinder egg or something inert. But if you actually look in the data, so um, in China, you mandatorily have to release an anonymized set of uh, all your recent openings. This data is just constantly being pumped out by games companies in China. And if you look at that, you'll see that actually loss chasing does occur. The more money you get from a loot box, the more valuable its contents, the more likely you are to just end your session. But if you get something rubbish, you're very, very, very likely to continue. We ran an analysis over uh, about a couple of million loot box openings, about 100,000 gamers. But wait, that's not all. <laughs> so, so it sort of said, oh, there's all this kind of predation, which is kind of a product of video games making this transition from products to platforms. But that's not all, because the way that video games and gambling in specific intersect is getting more extreme and more diverse every day. So this is the top grossing games on, on Google Play just for a random day. All these games that I've highlighted have one thing in common, and that is that they're all simulated gambling products and they're all part of a genre that we call social casino. 
So like this might look to you like an image of someone gambling, but they're not, at least not according to the UK Gambling Commission and many other regulatory authorities like it. Because in these games you can pay for chips, but you can never cash them out, they are not deemed as gambling and they're made available to children. This is a scandal that has yet to happen. I don't understand why people aren't up in arms about this. And if you look at the list of top grossing games, this is how a large proportion of the creative industries, when it comes to the game sector, are making money. Similarly, Twitch, a service that um, exists to help young people and gamers connect with influencers and watch them play games, has been co-opted in places by the gambling industry. This is a large subsection of Twitch. It's watching casino streams. It's literally just watching people in an ungated way gambling thousands and thousands of pounds worth of stuff on slot machines. And all these things are linked to gambling problems in the same way that loot boxes are. And when it comes to loot boxes, remember I said in 2019 it was at 59%? Well, someone did an update of our work last year and it turns out now it's at 77%. So 70% of the top grossing games on Google Play now contain loot boxes. So now we've got this really awful situation where we don't just have to worry about financial harm and loot boxes, we've got to worry about in a bunch of domains all these emerging activities. So we've got these problems. Many video games are now basically unregulated sales platforms. There are huge and obvious consumer protection issues. Labeling is kind of meaningless in this domain. No meaningful age restrictions that I can see of to protect children. And things appear to be worsening and diversifying. The industry thus far appears mostly interested in blocking and lobbying rather than regulating itself. Solutions? Self-regulation? Maybe we'll talk about it later, but I'm kind of unconvinced the industry has, the games industry as a whole, in particular big players, have kind of been quite brash about their belief in monetization of this sort. Maybe governmental intervention? That also looks unlikely in 2022. It looked a lot more likely in 2018. Changes to labelling. Labelling is controlled by self-regulatory or arms-length bodies that appear to have some sort of vested interest in the games industry, ESRB and PEGI. So maybe it's about education. Maybe it's about giving parents the tools to understand the games that people are playing. And maybe it's about activism. There's nothing better than make a fuss about something that you hate. And we've got a great example of this actually today. So remember I told you about those casino streams on Twitch? Well, a bunch of Twitch streamers basically got together and said, we will withhold our labour unless you get rid of this. And effective literally today, Twitch is removing all of its unregulated casino streams. It's only a subsection of the casino streams, but it's something and it shows how with loud voices we can make a difference here. So, so that's the end of my presentation. And uh, we're, uh, thank you.